So when I was thinking about, okay, well, what can I talk about? Um, when you work on the foundations of quantum mechanics, as I do, um, the obvious thing to talk about is Bell's theorem, right? So Bell's theorem is usually thought to be the best example of the interaction between philosophy um, and physics in quantum, in the foundations of quantum mechanics. And uh, I do still believe that. And um, however, Jim Witherall gave a pretty good summary of that in his talk. So I don't want to repeat that. So that caused me to rethink in less than a week what I actually want to talk about. And then Marco said that he wanted people who were going to say no to this question. He wanted the, some controversy. So uh, I hope this talk uh, is taken in the spirit it is intended, right? I really do general, genuinely work at the intersection of physics and philosophy and love both subjects, but I'm going to try to uh, at least make the argument that uh, perhaps the interaction between philosophy and physics in this subject area um, isn't as great as we uh, as we typically think. Okay, so I'm going to try and make that argument. I don't know how successful that'll be. That's an argument against you, Matt, because you have the most more philosopher that the teachers they know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there, there is that. Um, <laughs> we'll wait, wait till the conclusion. Okay. <laughs> uh, so before I start that, I just wanted to quickly advertise uh, the Philosophy of Physics Society and the journal Philosophy of Physics, uh, uh, both relatively new. Um, this came into being due to the fact that Statist Phil Mod Phys is being rolled back into the main journal. So um, this is supposed to be in some sense uh, a replacement. I am the uh, token physicist on the editorial board. <laughs> And uh, David Wallace is the chief editor, and he will be firing me as soon as he hears the content of this talk. <laughs> so, yeah. So this is this is the idea. What I want to try and argue contra what we've heard before is that uh, uh, that's harmful. So we should build a border wall between the disciplines <laughs> physics and philosophy. So we should try to do that. Um, right. Before before I start this, though, I, I need to warm up because I'm used to liking philosophy. So you need to see some quotes from physicists saying things that are hostile to philosophy. So we're going to play a quick game. I'm going to put up a quote and you can shout out which physicist you think said that. So the first one is um, the philosophers who are always on the outside making stupid remarks. Anybody who knows that? Well, who knows this? Hawking? Hawking. It's not Hawking. Uh, Feynman, yes. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Uh, from the character of physical law, yeah, he wasn't too charitable for those yes. How about this one? Uh, traditionally, these are questions for philosophy, but philosophy is dead. Philosophy has not kept up with modern developments. That's Hawking, that's that's Hawking. yeah, that's uh, particularly for, uh, from the book he wrote with Bernard Modno, uh, The Grand Design. I have to say, having read this book, there is philosophy in it, <laughs> not great philosophy. Um, so, you know. Uh, this one, okay. The insights of philosophers have occasionally benefited physicists, but generally in a negative fashion mm -hmm. by protecting them from the preconceptions of other philosophers. <laughs> Weinberg. Weinberg, yes, that's mm -hmm. right. Um, <clears throat> so we, we already saw that he's not too favorable towards philosophy. Uh, so lastly, this one may be slightly more obscure. Uh, as a practicing physicist, however, the situation is somewhat different. There I, and most of the colleagues with whom I have discussed this matter, I found that philosophical speculations about physics and the nature of science are not particularly useful and have had little or no impact upon progress in my field. Anybody know who that is? No. No, it is slightly more obscure. Um, this was also, all these come from like fairly, uh, well, exchanges that created a fair amount of publicity on the internet. Um, this one is Lawrence Krauss, and it came in the context of uh, his book, The Universe from Nothing, they claimed that we didn't need uh, philosophy because we understand how you know, the universe can be created from nothing. Of course, he was highly criticized for that. The interesting thing about this is, you know, uh, this uh, article I'm quoting from is actually his apology. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, because Dan Dennett was at least somebody who he respected and criticized him for his comments. Uh, and so he decided to write an apology, and this is what he said in it. Uh, so. 
All right, so now, now we're warmed up. Um, of course, these quotes are uh, fine, but they're kind of based on nothing, right? It's just, this is just, there, there aren't any detailed arguments about the nature of philosophy here, so it's kind of, you can kind of ignore them. And um, since this is MPP, I did wonder, because, you know, we've, we've heard about physicists saying negative things about philosophy. I, I wondered about mathematics. Do physicists also say negative things about mathematics? Yes. Well, yeah, uh, so, I mean, probably one of the most famous ones is uh, uh, Pauli's uh, Gruppenpest, right? So he didn't like the group theory coming into physics or found it too hard to learn. Heisenberg said uh, bad things about having to learn what a matrix was as well. But uh, here are some other ones. You know, here's some hostility towards mathematical rigor. I have to say, I found these quotes in an article by Nicholas Reddy. Physicists don't really like mathematical rigor always. Uh, so uh, here are some quotes. Yeah, so, so Anderson says, we're talking here about theoretical physics and therefore, of course, mathematical rigor is irrelevant and impossible. Feynman again, see the character of physical law is a great book if you want uh, to see a physicist uh, disparaging everybody else. <laughs> so the mathematical rigor of great precision is not very useful in physics, but one should not criticize the mathematicians on this score. They're doing their own job. Well, he's not being too insulting, but he's insane, he's irrelevant. Uh, this one's interesting because Streeter and White, Whiteman are mathematical physicists. They're reporting what other people say, say about them. Um, so it's kind of a, a known goal, if you like. Uh, the physicists who have engaged in this kind of work, so he's talking about algebraic, axiomatic uh, field, field theory, uh, are sometimes dubbed the Weltverein. The Weltverein. Okay, so the best of my ability, I can translate that as the field association. Okay. It's not actually real German, but uh, <laughs> some dialect. Um, cynical observers have compared them to the Shakers, a religious, religious sect of New England who built solid barns and then celibate lines, a non scientific equivalent of proving rigorous theorems and calculating no cross sections. <laughs> so, uh, the point of this is not to like ridicule <laughs> mathematics, but to, to say that the fact that physicists say hostile things towards philosophy is not unusual. <laughs> physicists. Well, you can add this mission. Hostility to mathematical yeah. rigor that also exists. Yeah. So, okay, yes, that's true. Um, physicists are kind of arrogant in general. And so we say snarky things about all fields. <laughs> so the fact that we're saying snarky things about philosophy doesn't mean necessarily anything bad about philosophy. It means, you know, you've done enough that we noticed you. So uh, <laughs> yeah. that's really good. You're in good company. But I wouldn't take it too seriously. And I wouldn't necessarily try to. Um, refute people like Weinberg um, point by point. Anyway, um, so in reality, where I work is kind of here, right? So in reality, these two things aren't separate. I don't think I'm supposed to walk too far from here. So I'll go back. Um, <clears throat> we have, there is overlap. There's a borderlands region. Obviously, there are questions where it's not clear, quite clear whether it's physics and philosophy. So I work here in the Badlands. And so to me, it looks like physics and philosophy are very closely related, um, but it could just be uh, a feature of being in, in this borderlands, right? So what we really want to ask is, you know, not, not are there, is, does this region exist? But you would want to ask if, uh, you know, ideas from here really penetrate deeply into here and vice versa, okay? Because, you know, the fact that disciplinary boundaries are uh, you know, a little bit difficult to precisely define, that's not very, uh, very insightful. Okay, so following Thomas's uh, classification, what we want to talk about is difference making work. Okay? <laughs> so I want work in one field that affects the core of some other field and becomes part of its canon, if you like, right? So not just that somebody necessarily published something, a philosopher published in a physics paper. What I want is to see that that piece of work um, is so important to the field that it becomes part of the canon. It appears in textbooks. We teach it to all of our graduate students. You know, uh, the number of times it's used in research papers, uh, you know, for a long period of time, things, things like that. Um, <clears throat> I definitely appreciate the efforts to investigate this stuff with uh, bibliometrics. Um, I think it's difficult to quantify 100% accurately, especially since, um, you know, uh, 
it takes a lot of time for for it to become apparent what what's what's um, what's canon. Uh, and on the other hand, if we just look at case studies, we may be accused of cherry picking, right? So it was quite easy for Jim in his talk to find examples where it looked like philosophy has contributed positively to physics, right? So if we're going to look for those case studies, we have to actively look for case studies which show the opposite as well in order to get a balanced picture. So even if I don't believe it, it's uh, it behooves us to try and find um, situations where the interaction is perhaps not so good. So this in Jim in Jim's talk, this was uh, his virtuous triangle of the philosophy of physics. Okay, so so philosophy of physics directly affects these three areas. I want to expand the philosophy side quite considerably. I think uh, when people think about physics, they naturally think about its uh, about its implications for metaphysics, for what exists and what we can say about that. But uh, you know, um, <clears throat> it has at least um, applications in in these other fields as well. I would personally argue that epistemology is perhaps the most important one where there there is overlap. So. We're going to see some examples of all three. Okay, so um, here's here's where where we're at. Okay, so I'm going to start with what I'm going to call the bad. So this is uh, where you use quantum physics, and based on quantum physics, you try to draw a very strong conclusion about some field of philosophy. Now, of course, if you're doing metaphysics, you should have some general awareness of what the laws of physics are like. But if you get into the specifics and you try to draw a very strong conclusion, that's often not justified. Primarily because we really don't know what quantum mechanics says about the nature of reality. So I'm going to give some examples, some of which will be more controversial than others. So um, I believe the notion of objective chance is a mistake. Uh, quantum logical realism, that whole story. Um, and this is by a physicist, Wigner's argument for dualism about consciousness. Uh, that's not an argument by a philosopher, but it is a philosophical argument uh, made by a physicist. And then we might talk, talk about the good, and this is kind of what uh, Jim was talking about, uh, that philosophy can preserve important subjects that physics is ignoring or hostile to for a while. And the main example is Bell's theorem. Since Jim did such a good uh, job of showing that that was a good example, I'm going to have to at least try and show that it's tepid um, in the sense of maybe the significance of the interactions between philosophers and physicists is a bit oversold. So I'm going to try my best to make the argument um, that at least the history is much more complicated than, than uh, you suggest. So that's basically the outline. Okay, so first of all, applications of quantum physics to philosophy. First of all, you know, I want to say, uh, as, I, as I already said, um, at least in Western analytical philosophy, um, it is fairly commonplace to assert that metaphysics should at least take into account the picture of the world entailed by contemporary physics, right? So you typically don't make assumptions that at least, you know, we don't think are uh, justified in modern physics. So for example, if your account of what a law is suggest that it has to be deterministic, then you should be skeptical of that. Uh, if you think that the fundamental ontology of the world has to be particles with definite spatial trajectories, you might want to avoid that in your metaphysics. Um, the, you know, given uh, the nature of quantum mechanics, the idea that anything that exists is necessarily also observable, so some kind of operationalism or whatever, now, those kinds of things are uh, suspect. And so if you're doing metaphysics, you don't necessarily have to take into account the details of the way quantum mechanics works, but you should be suspicious of such claims. So it's good at telling you what not to do, and I would not argue against that. But the problem is when people draw very strong conclusions based on uh, how quantum mechanics apparently is. That's not been successful. And the main reason why it's not been successful is because, you know, the interpretation of quantum mechanics is unsettled. And so what the theory says about the nature of reality is controversial. And that seems to be 
that it will be the case for at least the time being. Personally, by the way, I am of the opinion, perhaps the minority opinion, that there is something called a correct interpretation of quantum mechanics that we haven't found yet. Um, and it's very likely to be none of the above. So from my pers perspective, uh, especially, the idea of drawing an implication from any particular interpretation of quantum mechanics is almost certainly going to give you um, something false. OK, so let me look at the examples. Examples of inappropriately strong philosophical conclusions that are at least partly drawn from quantum physics. I'm going to start with the notion of objective chance. Now, objective chance has several origins. Um, and uh, so I've often talked about David Lewis and said, well, you know, David Lewis wanted a notion of objective chance because of quantum mechanics. And then people turn around to me and say, well, that's silly. He never talks about quantum mechanics. He never goes into the details of quantum mechanics. Of course he doesn't, but this is what he says in the very first paragraph, like literally straight after the introduction of his uh, famous paper. It says, among the propositions that deserve our credence, we find, for instance, the proposition that as a matter of contingent fact about the world, any tritian F atom that now exists has a certain chance of decaying within a year. Okay? And so this is the main example. He doesn't, I have to say, he doesn't really give a lot of other examples in the paper or reasons why you should believe in objective chance. Now, <clears throat> Popper, too, who was uh, promoting propensity theories, he also uses quantum mechanics as his primary example for why we need them. And indeed, both of them say that if you have deterministic laws, then the uh, objective probabilities are always zero or one. Now, a lot of modern commentators disagree with that and think that you can make sense of objective chances in uh, classical statistical mechanics, but at least for these two, um, quantum mechanics seem to be the primary uh, reason. So um, it's often asserted in the philosophy of probability that there are different types of probability. There's objective chance, there's subjective credence, maybe there's some other things, epistemic probabilities. Um, and if you read textbook on the philosophy of probability, you'll often find that uh, it's just asserted that there are these different types of probability and we have to make sense of what they are rather than questioning whether any of them exist. Now, if the, if the main reason for believing in objective chance is quantum mechanics, then that's a bad reason because um, <clears throat> there are interpretations of quantum mechanics which are, for example, deterministic or interpretations which deny the notion of objective chance, which I would argue uh, most interpretations in the Copenhagen ish spirit. Um, it is also the case that if objective chance is meant be applicable primarily to chances in physics, then it's done a pretty awful job. Because the fact is that nobody uses any of these objective chance theories when they're doing physics, right? Um, so there are various types of objective chance theories. It's like from my point of view, um, if you look at a propensity theory, then propensities are definitely not probabilities because they uh, apply in one direction of time and not the other direction of time. So they don't correctly capture what a probability is. And then if you look at sort of more human objective chances like David Lewis um, proposed, there are some of those theories that work, I believe. The ones that work uh, do not have the correct um, relationship to statistical practice to be practically useful. Like you can't say that you're finding the objective chances when you do a bunch of repeated experiments. So the ones that, the ones that work are inapplicable and the ones that are applicable don't work. That's my view. So uh, in my view, it's a massive, it was just a massive mistake to draw the conclusion from the fact that apparently there are these objective probabilities in quantum mechanics that we need a notion of objective chance. Now, there are other reasons why people say that, but as I say, at least for uh, Lewis and Popper, that was a primary example. That's probably the most controversial case I'm gonna give because um, the idea that you need objective chance plus um, credences on top of it is uh, pretty much mainstream in philosophy of physics these days. All right, um, so this one will be less controversial because most people don't like it that much anyway. Um, since Jim had a picture of, of von Neumann wearing a pineapple, I had to find one of these pictures where he's wearing a funny hat. So, so there we go. 
I don't know what kind of hat that's supposed to be. Um, <laughs> anyway, so we want to talk about uh, quantum logic. Um, so it has its origins in this paper of Birkhoff and von Neumann, uh, where they noticed that the lattice of closed subspaces or the Hilbert space can be viewed as a generalization of Boolean algebra. So we can think of it as the basis for some kind of logic. That logic doesn't satisfy the distributive law. Um, they further went into some axiomatization of this. Other people built on their work. But originally the idea was that this could somehow be the found mathematical foundation of quantum theory. Von well, Neumann didn't stick with the idea very long. Uh, he had various reasons for thinking this wasn't going to work out. And he moved on to the program of developing the theory of operator algebras, which arguably was much more successful. Um, <clears throat> however, other people stuck with this. So I'm not going to complain about anything in the mathematical point of view of this. As, as an area of mathematics, it's obviously perfectly fine. Um, and there's a whole uh, field also, which is broadly called operational quantum logic, thinking of this as, as describing operational theories in some way. I also don't have any big problem with that. I may think that you know it's not the most fruitful route to work on, but nonetheless, I have no problem with that work. What I have a problem with is um, what's called quantum logical realism. And I think this is, was a fairly big blunder. Um, OK, so it starts with Quine uh, and two dogmas. So in this uh, paper, Quine uh, is trying to dismantle the analytic synth synthetic distinction. So he basically says that you know it's not been demonstrated that there is such a distinction. And uh, so even mathematics, logic, for instance, could fall on the synthetic side and could be uh, empirical. So in particular, he uh, argues that logic may be empirical and that um, in particular, he does give the example of the paradoxes of quantum mechanics as one reason for thinking that. Okay. Later on, in, this, in later papers, he says, you know, I don't think quantum mechanics is a good example, but nonetheless, it was in the original paper. So uh, Putnam follows on with this. He's He's familiar with uh, Birkhoff and von Neumann. And what he wants to say is that the way we're going to understand quantum mechanics is that you know, Boolean logic is replaced with this quantum logic, really. Okay, this is the true logic of the world. Okay, and that will explain all these quantum paradoxes. And he draws the analogy with uh, general relativity and geometry, right? So the idea is this, if you, uh, believe that the world has to be have Euclidean geometry, you'd have a very, very hard time understanding uh, what's going on with gravity and general relativity and even special relativity. But once you give up that notion, so you give up a cherished notion and you say, okay, we have a, a non-Euclidean geometry, suddenly it's much easier and everything can fall into place. So the idea is that in quantum mechanics as well, uh, the reason why you find it so difficult is that we're making some assumption about the nature of reality that's unjustified. You get rid of this one assumption, then everything will be fine. Um, and, you know, I quite like that idea. You know, and a lot of physicists like that idea that we're making some assumption that's unjustified. Um, so the idea itself is quite attractive. Uh, we'll see um, why it might be viewed as a massive blunder um, afterwards. So let me just explain what's supposed to go on in this logic. So um, let let OBS T be uh, the set of observable physical quantities in some theory, physical theory that you're talking about. And uh, for each observable, we'll have a set of values. So the observables might be things like position and momentum, and the values, set of values might be the real numbers, for instance. Okay, so uh, Putnam asserts that you can say this in, in quantum logic. So for all observables, there exists some x, some value, such that x equals x. So that assertion seems to state that um, all quantities have a value. And that's the basis of claiming that this is a realist interpretation. Right? Every it, it's, it's doing better than sort of standard Copenhagen, which says that you know some quantities have values and some quantities don't have values. Um, but you can also make the following assertion, which is that there exists an x, actually most of the x's, um, such that for all values, 
X doesn't take that value, okay? And the reason why these aren't contradictory is because to get from here to here, you need distributivity, okay? So you can argue about whether this uh, thing here, this second statement undermines the first. But anyway, Putnam wanted to say that we could maintain a variety of realism by saying, um, you know, there is a real logic of the world and it's uh, non-classical. Um, in particular, uh, to give you a, a specific example, uh, if you consider the double slit experiment, we can consider the two propositions, the electron goes through the left slit and the electron goes through the, white, uh, the right slit. Um, this assertion here would be, would say that uh, there exists a slit that uh, the electron goes through. And this second assertion would say, it doesn't go through the left slit, but it doesn't go through the right slit. But we can still say there exists a slit that goes through. It's a funny logic. So um, Putnam goes through various of the paradoxes and shows how you can sort of get a at least semi-realist interpretation. Okay, so uh, in this context, usually uh, Mike uh, Dummett's paper is mentioned as well. Um, and I think in the philosophical audience, it's often believed that uh, Dummett's article is a real, real damning criticism. Lots of people have written about it since, but anyway, uh, it's worth uh, discussing. So his main argument is that both distributivity and bivalence are required for scientific realism. So if Putnam's trying to be a realist, he's, he's failed. So distributivity, we've talked about, bivalence just means things are either true or false and nothing in between. And in quantum logic, of course, that is also not true. Quantum logic isn't bivalent. Um, right, so uh, this argument is not really compelling to, to, at least to a physicist's eyes, I think. Um, so first of all, bear in mind that many people are willing to give up scientific realism wholesale. So the alternative to this, or at least the default alternative, is something like the Copenhagen interpretation, where you just don't talk about properties of systems and things like that at all, right? So even if this doesn't give you, even if like the standard notions of realism um, aren't enough, uh, you know, aren't captured by quantum logic, uh, you know, the response to this is to just say, okay, well, let's have a more permissive notion of realism, okay? Let's, let's generalize it to something else. And that's what an advocate at this point of view um, is likely to say. Now, Many people have criticized this since. Let me let me give you the best arguments. And these arguments, I think, show that the whole thing was uh, sort of um, doomed from the start. So first of all, again, the interpretation of quantum mechanics, this is the main argument against all of these things, right? The interpretation of quantum mechanics is unsettled. And most of the interpretations don't require revision of logic. In fact, any of the... Uh, uh, interpretations that are seriously advocated by a uh, largest group of people, none of them, none of them do. Okay, so therefore, drawing strong conclusions about the empirical character of logic from quantum mechanics just seems unjustified. Remember, Putnam's goal here isn't really to explain quantum mechanics. His goal is to prove quite right. He wants to prove that logic is empirical. Okay, so, so basing an argument for that on quantum mechanics seems uh, flawed. Other arguments against it, uh, so logical pluralism, uh, I know not everybody's logical pluralist, but I think it should be these days. So if, if you do not believe that there is something like a unique logic of the world, but you have different logics that are relevant to different domains, then saying that quantum mechanics has its own logic does not do anything to resolve metaphysical problems because it says nothing about metaphysics. It's just saying, okay, when we reason about this kind of system, we use this logic. When we reason about that kind of system, we use, use that logic. Um, since that's changeable anyway, even within the ordinary classical world, um, it's not really saying anything uh, about the nature of reality, which is what you want in a scientific realist theory. Um, to me, uh, this is uh, also a damning critique. I, I must say that uh, I'm basing this comment on something called the Spekin's toy theory. However, in operational quantum logic, this point was well understood. It was well understood that they were basically classical models, fully classical models, where if you ran the same arguments as we do in quantum mechanics, you would end up with a non-classical logic. 
just by virtue of the fact that um, there's some restriction on how much we can know about the system. Um, so this was well known in operational quantum logic and it ought to have been a damning critique of uh, Putnam because at the end of the day, if you're trying to solve metaphysical problems and you come up with a theory that is metaphysically exactly the same as classical mechanics, and yet you say, oh, it has this non-standard logic, then that's telling you that that logic is not telling you anything about the nature of reality. So, you know, at least from the first, I think this it was, it should have been obvious that this was going to be a failure uh, from the start. And uh, the reason why I bring it up is, you know, if it was just Putnam doing this on his own, that would be okay. But actually there was a very large group of philosophers of physics who thought this was a good route uh, for a period of time in the, like, about the 70s and 80s. It disappeared. It disappeared from view. Eventually, I think people made the right decision about it, but uh, for a long period of time, people were working on that and physicists totally ignored it, right? Uh, as, as is the correct thing. Um, okay, so <clears throat> now I'm gonna talk about Wigner's argument for dual, dualism. So this is what I would consider to be a bad argument by a physicist. Okay, so first of all, uh, we have to talk about Wigner's friend. What's the Wigner's friend argument? Wigner's friend argument is the same as the Schrodinger's cat argument, except we take out the cat and put in a human. Usually you don't kill the human either. So it's a question of the human inside the box is making a measurement and sees one outcome or the other. Okay. This argument is regarded as important today. Uh, Wigner's paper, which is about the mind-body question, is very highly cited because, um, you know, the reason is in some interpretations of quantum mechanics, it matters that observers matter, okay? And uh, the difference between this and Schrodinger's cat is that a friend is unambiguously an observer. Assuming that we're not endorsing solipsism, we assume that human beings at least uh, see definite outcomes. So there's no doubt that the collapse postulate applies to uh, a human being making a quantum measurement. There are various extensions of Wigner's friend argument um, and they are interesting. But you see, this is the way we think about it today, but that's not the reason Wigner introduced it or the argument he used to introduce, introduce it. So I'm going to, what I want to assert here is that this paper is highly cited. It's not because physicists loved Wigner's philosophical argument, that was completely ignored. They took a little piece of the paper and, and uh, used it for other purposes. So I, wanna, so I want to explain why I think this argument was uh, doomed from the start. So first of all, we start with a materialist argument against dualism, and this is fairly standard. So the idea is that, look, okay, you're gonna tell me that there's something outside of physics that's responsible for consciousness. Okay, the laws of physics are a closed system. There's nowhere in Einstein's equations or whatever that says, okay, here's the bit where the outside consciousness influences the system. So there's an autonomous system. There's no room for something outside to act on it. For example, a dualist state of consciousness. So we know that material reality should affect the state of consciousness because we see the world, but there's no way for consciousness to act back. It's just along for the ride. And then the argument is, well, you know, we really don't know examples where something influences something and there's no back action, right? So the idea is that it's implausible for one phenomenon to have an influence on another without an influence in the other direction. Therefore, dualist states of consciousness, which would have to be along for the ride, are implausible. So this is the argument that Wigner sets out to, to destroy using quantum mechanics. And I have to say that, you know, in his, uh, in his defense, Wigner is fairly sheepish about this in his paper, right? He gives, in his paper, he gives two arguments uh, for dualism. And he says, the first argument for dualism is obviously the best one, but hey, I've got this other little argument as well. You know, I know it's not that great, but uh, and this is the quantum argument, the second one. But anyway. So this is similar to the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. So uh, Wigner says, well, a measurement device is just made of atoms. So anything that's just made of atoms, just physical stuff, you know, as far as we know, quantum mechanics is a fundamental physical law. So it can be described according to quantum mechanics uh, in the measurement interaction, it will end up in a superposition. Something like that cannot collapse the wave function. It's just a physical system. 
Now, if I put my friend in the box, I could say the same thing about them. They're also just made of atoms. So they should be described according to quantum mechanics and end up in a superposition. But however, I'm not a solipsist. So I know that my friend observes a definite outcome. How do I know that? Because when I make a measurement, I observe a definite outcome. So clearly the friend does as well. So the friend is forced to describe themselves as having caused the collapse of the wave function. There's no way of avoiding it. They've seen something definite. Now, is this part. So if uh, Vigna is allowed to describe the situation as a superposition, and the friend is allowed to, has to describe it as one thing or the other, then that's a contradiction. You can't have a contradiction in physics, right? Because the friend sees a definite outcome, the friend's outcome must be right. So now what's the difference between the measurement device and the friend? The only relevant difference, since the friend is made out of atoms, is that uh, the friend is conscious. Therefore, it must be consciousness that collapses the wave function. He does actually say it as strongly as that. But some people um, think that Nikola didn't really believe that consciousness collapses the wave function. He says it like that. However, if consciousness collapses the wave function, then it is untrue that physics is a closed system and that consciousness doesn't act back on it. Here is a back action. So the fact that consciousness collapses the wave function shows that in fact, this materialist argument is wrong and there is a back action. So that's the argument he gives. Um, now, the, the problem with this argument is, first of all, that Wigner assumes that if there are two different quantum state assignments, so if Wigner assigns a superposition and the friend assigns a, one of the elements of that superposition, then that's a contradiction. That is true in what is, so this interpretation has many names, orthodox textbook, Dirac von Neumann, Hungarian interpretation. So uh, actually Miklos already coined the term Hungarian interpretation because he argues that it comes from Wigner and von Neumann, that they're the ones who, who advocated it. Um, it's definitely not the Copenhagen interpretation. The Copenhagen interpretation does not think that quantum state assignments are physical things, right? Um, so that, that, wouldn't, that kind of argument wouldn't be made in the Copenhagen interpretation, which was supposedly the dominant interpretation of quantum mechanics at the time, right? That's what people subscribe to. Um, also, he assumes that, you know, the interpretation of quantum mechanics must have collapses, actual physical collapses of the wave function in it. But this is true in a spontaneous collapse theory, which by the way, uh, Wigner were not formulated at the time that Wigner was writing, but it's not true in many worlds of De Broglie Bohm, um, so in, I'd say in most interpretations of quantum mechanics that are advocated, uh, just the argument falls down. And it falls down even in what I would say is the, should have been the dominant interpretation at the time. I apologize for Kelvin at the moment. Trying to say. The view that consciousness causes collapse or is needed for collapse was a fringe view in Wigner's time and is even more so today. So if you want to argue for dualism, it's really, really not a good idea to do it on the basis of quantum mechanics. It's just confusing, just confusing the issue. Okay, good. So uh, that's my attempt to show that you shouldn't derive philosophical conclusions from quantum mechanics. Now let's look at uh, the example of what would be the good, but I'm gonna, but since uh, Jim already tried to argue that this was good, I'm gonna try and argue that it's just okay. So there are examples where philosophers, in fact, in actual fact, did contribute to quantum physics, that's undeniable, but maybe the impact of their contribution or its necessity has been overstated. And so the main example of that um, is Bell's theorem. Okay, so in order to really resolve this question, you would need a thorough historical analysis, okay? That historical analysis is actually happening. Right, so um, the sad fact about the history of quantum mechanics is the following. There are lots of histories of quantum mechanics that discuss the theory up to about 1935 and center on the einstein bohr debates, right? And often they'll mention the Bell inequalities just so that they can say at the end, oh yeah, by the way, Einstein's wrong, okay? There's lots of histories that are like that. Um, however, and, and the reason for that is that after that time period, most physicists shifted onto other things, into quantum field theory, particle physics, things like that. That was 
the center of attention for physics. So historians have mostly focused on that. In recent years, in the last decade or so, you know, partly due to the renewed interest in things like Bell's theorem, um, historians have started to write histories of that period in the foundations of quantum mechanics between, uh, say, the Second World War and the 1990s. Um, those histories, however, do contradict each other on what were the important things that happened. They, they emphasize different things. For example, um, you know, David Kaiser's book, How the Hippies um, Save Physics, if you believe that book, I don't think it's a particularly good history myself, but if you believe that book, it's not because of philosophers that we know about Bell's theorem, it's because of a bunch of hippies in uh, Berkeley who couldn't get jobs in physics, and that's <laughs> how things go. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, but nevertheless, I, what I'm gonna do here, since I don't have the full details of the history, is I'm going to try and uh, construct a counter argument to the significance of some of these um, contributions to the philosophers. So, um, Jim in particular mentioned uh, Abner Shimony. Arthur Fine came up as the perhaps the best example of a physicist publisher of a philosopher publishing in physics. Itamar Pitelsky was mentioned. I will add some other examples. I'm in particular going to talk about Tim Maudlin because it's a, it's a funny story. Um, <clears throat> right. So, what happened with Abner Sh Shimony? Okay, so first of all, Bell publishes his paper and Shimony receives a preprint of it almost immediately. How does he receive it almost immediately? Why? Because Shimony is teaching a course in the foundations of quantum mechanics. He's virtually the only person in the world doing this at the time. Um, and so that's known. He's known to be the guy who thinks about this stuff. So he sent uh, a, a copy of the paper. He recognizes its significance almost immediately and starts thinking about experimental tests. So credit for that. John Clauser, a physicist, discovers Bell's paper in about 1967. He says that he was um, just in a library casually browsing physics journals and he came across it. Uh, he also recognizes its significance and he independently starts designing an experimental test. Shimony re realizes he needs some help, some, some physicists. So he, he enlists uh, Horn, who is a grad student. He is a grad student in physics. And Holt, another physics graduate student, Holt is an experimentalist. They need somebody to form an experiment. Now, while they're still working, Clauser somehow beats them to the punch a little bit, right? He, he uh, has designed an experimental test and he announces a talk on it at the American Physical Society March meeting. American Physical Society March meeting is a very big meeting and the, they publish his thick book of abstracts Shimney has a copy of the book of abstracts, leaves through it and finds, oh, this guy's doing the experiment that we wanted to do. So at this point, there's some kind of circling around each other, worrying about being scooped. Should we collaborate with each other or should we compete with each other? Eventually, they decide to collaborate with each other and uh, the resulting paper introduces the CHSH inequality. Uh, and that is experimentally robust and perhaps most widely used uh, Bell inequality today. Okay, that's the story. But first of all, let's re remind ourselves that Shimony has a PhD in physics. In fact, he does his PhD in philosophy first, then says, you know what, I'm interested in physics, and then does a PhD in, in physics. I have the feeling that in philosophy of physics, it's usually the other way around if you have to, I don't know. But, <laughs> but anyway, um, so his interest in the foundations of quantum mechanics emerges during his physics PhD. Actually, Wigner is his advisor. And as we've seen, Wigner's interest is in the foundations of quantum mechanics, one of the few physicists who is. So his interest in the foundations of quantum mechanics, although he's arguably a philosopher, comes through his work in physics. So the fact that he had a philosophical background undoubtedly helped him to appreciate the significance, but somebody else appreciated the significance, Clauser. And Clauser had no philosophical background. So this shows it is not necessary to have a philosophical background to appreciate the significance of Bell's theorem. So arguably, the authorship of the CHSH paper is greater than 75% physicists, because uh, Shimony is not 100% a philosopher. <laughs> um, now, it, so uh, it is true that the CHSH inequality is used in tests of Bell's theorem. However, it is arguably more common these days 
can use the clouds of horn inequality. Notice clouds of horn has no shimony in it. So that's a paper by two physicists. Uh, why is that? Um, because, uh, well, there's something in Bell's theorem called the detection loophole. Uh, so if, if you're, so, you know, photon detectors don't detect every single photon. If, um, if they don't detect, en detect enough of the photons, then you can uh, have a conspirat sort of conspiratorial model where uh, photons selectively decide not to be detected, and that enables the model to be local. So different inequalities are going to have thresholds for ruling that out. Um, for the clouds of Horn inequality, you only need to detect 67% of the uh, photons. And so that often gets used more these days. So in actual fact, Shimony contributed significantly. Um, would physicists have done it without him? Well, first of all, he is half a physicist, but secondly, I would conjecture that Clauser would have eventually got there on his own. So uh, it's arguable the extent to which this was like really, really important in the history. Now, bear in mind, I'm not trying to insult anybody here. I'm trying to construct a counter e example. I, of course, think that uh, Shimony was uh, very important. Let's look at Arthur Fine. So this one, I know, it's a little bit harder to say uh, anything negative about it, but let, let me try. Um, <laughs> So uh, the, the papers that are cited, the very highly cited papers, those two papers that uh, Thomas told us about, they're about something that's called Fine's theorem, as you might expect. Um, so Fine's theorem says the existence of a locally causal model, so that's local in the sense of Bell's theorem, if it can generate you know, the results of experiments, a set of correlations, that's equivalent to the existence of a joint probability distribution over all of the observables. That's the theorem. So, here is what it means for, so X and Y are here the choices of um, observable to measure, and A and B are the outcomes. And this is what it means to have a locally causal model with a hidden parameter lambda. Um, let's suppose that X and Y can take values zero and one. The equivalent thing in Fine's theorem would be a joint probability distribution over A0, A1, B0, B1, which means A0 means that's the value that A will have when um, the setting is zero. So the idea is that this joint probability distribution has the same marginals uh, as, as this guy. So the observable probabilities are the same and the existence of those things are equivalent. And the theorem is not very hard to prove. So it's this kind of thing that a mathematician would call a physicist theorem. Um, it's really literally two lines. The, the significance is realizing that there's something that can be proved there. Right, it's not the actual proof. Which once, once, so once somebody tells you this is true, you can probably do it in about five minutes. So, it's not the difficulty of the result; it's the realizing that there's a result. Okay, so now Fine's theorem has a lot of citations. I would argue that many of those citations are for making an argument that is bad, wrong, wrong and bad. Okay. Um, so maybe we want to sort of discount all those citations when dis discussing whether this should be part of the canon. Okay, so Fine is not a scientific realist, okay? And scientific realists like the idea of these hidden, maybe there are these hidden parameters. But Fine isn't a straightforward scientific realist um, anyway. Uh, so he didn't like assumptions about some observable parameters. So for him, the idea of this was to shift attention to the joint probability assumption. These uh, A0, A1, B0, and B1, those are all things that are potentially observable, not in the same run of the experiment, but they're all uh, quantities that can be observed. So he wanted to say, well, the assumption is local, uh, is sorry, this joint probability assumption. But this has led many physicists in their papers that cite him to make the following argument. So, Bell's theorem is based on the assumption that there is a joint probability distribution. I do not believe in the existence of a joint probability distribution. In particular, Copenhagen uh, would deny that. Therefore, I do not accept the conclusion of Bell's theorem. I believe that is a confused argument. The assumption of Bell's theorem is local causality, not joint probabilities. Now, those are mathematically equivalent, but conceptually distinct assumptions. One of them is capturing something mathematical about sort of the joint existence of these things. 
and the other one is supposed to be capturing a notion of locality. Okay, so you can't argue against the notion of locality just by saying that you don't like its implication. The implication is an implication. You have to provide an argument for why you don't think local causality correctly captures the notion of local influences in physics. That is, and you can make such arguments, but that is the correct kind of argument to make. So arguably Fine's theorem has muddied the waters uh, to, to a large extent. Now, <clears throat> there are good uses of Fine theorem as well. As a technical result, it's very, very useful. And, but uh, I would like to understand the percentage of cit citations to Fine's paper that are of the bad argument form <laughs> versus the uh, useful result form. And that is uh, difficult to say. Okay, I'm gonna move on to Patelsky, he was mentioned too. Uh, I don't have bad things to say about Patelsky, his stuff is great. Um, you look at his book, it's called Quantum Probability, Quantum Logic. It doesn't really have any quantum logic in it, a little bit, but not very much. Um, he does use Fine's result, right? Because what he wants to do is understand the mathematical structure of Bell's theorem, of correlations that satisfy Bell's theorem. So he realizes that there is this old work of George Bull, which um, <clears throat> aimed to place constraints on probability assignments to different logical propositions. He showed that they you know, that these generally form a polytope. But when you've got this joint probability distribution, of course, you can say, you know, what constraints have to be on these marginal distributions in order for this joint probability distribution to exist. And so you can find that, uh, that this, these are going to be described by polytopes. And that the Bell inequalities are just the facet, facets of this correlation polytope. And that we can understand the mathematically like this. All work that people do today, theoretical work on Bell inequality, is based on this framework. Okay, this is the very start of this framework. The book was published in 1989. He also does something which is very remarkable. So remember, 1989, quantum information theory doesn't really exist yet. Not in its, not in its current form, but many people know about it. He shows in the book that determining whether a set of correlations is inside this polytope or outside it, uh, is it, whether it's inside rather, is an MP hard problem. Very few philosophers would think to do that. Uh, in fact, very, very few physicists would think to do that. You need to be like a mathematician or a computer scientist at this, this time to work on this kind of stuff, complexity theory. Okay, so notice, however, it, I say Patelsky is classified as a philosopher, but there's hardly any philosophy in the book, like maybe a paragraph or two, right? The book is a mathematics or a physics book, right? It's published in lecture notes in physics, not lecture notes in philosophy or physics or philosophy. It reads like a math physics book, okay? It's mostly equations, technical proofs, that kind of thing. Um, I also want to say that although this is highly cited, I know for a fact that the vast majority of people who cite it have never read it. Not no. many. Because I come from an era, like it's not true anymore, but in my era when I was doing my PhD, everything wasn't online. Okay, so most things weren't online. In fact, in particular, this book was not available online anywhere. And so if you wanted to look at this book, you had to make an interlibrary loan because most libraries didn't have very many copies of it because it, again, Bell's theorem was not a very popular subject at this time. So I noticed at the time that there are a vast number of papers appearing on the physics archive that cite this. Almost anything doing technical work on Bell and Quartz cites this book, it gets tons and tons of citations. But uh, you know, I'm I'm working at a, a pretty big university, University of Bristol. We have a substantial, a substantial library. We didn't have this book. I, being a sort of conceptually minded physicist, think that if something is very commonly cited in the papers I'm reading, I better read it. I better get hold of a copy of this. It takes about six months for the interlibrary loan to come through, and then I don't even get to keep it for very long. So I read the book. Um, it is implausible to me that this was done by the hundreds and hundreds of physicists who cited this paper. I think it was just generally known that he introduced the polytope thing and, uh, and so people cited it. And, and so this may be, it may be shocking to a philosophy audience, I don't know. But 
the number of papers that physicists cite that they actually read is a lot lower than you would expect, right? In, so, in a lot of cases, it's like, sort of, we know that this result came from so-and-so, so we need to cite one of his papers. Paper may be very technical, so you, you don't want to necessarily spend the time reading it. Like, for example, the einstein podolsky rosen paper is hugely cited. I would bet that uh, most of those citations are just because, you know, people want to cite something that's the origin of entanglement or non-locality or something. Um, I don't think most physicists have read that paper. So this, I want to urge caution about uh, if something's very highly cited in the physics literature, it means that the result is influential or at least like the, the kind of thing that's talking about is influential. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that people have read it. Physicists often like to redirect things on their own. Um, so it's difficult, it's difficult to evaluate that. However, this is a very good book that's worth reading. <laughs> so uh, let me just say that. Now, <clears throat> here I want to, to, to finish off, this is the last one, um, talk about something which uh, illustrates what I think happens very, very commonly in this field. So Tim Maudlin uh, has a book, Quantum Non-Locality and Relativity. Um, it, this is a very well-known book in the philosophy of physics. If you're a philosopher of physics and you're going to work on Bell's theorem, you should probably read this book. Okay, it's that well-known. He's the first person in this book to study a natural question. Okay, it's a natural question, um, you know, it's, it's a natural question from a modern point of view anyway. So, yeah, okay, so we've concluded that nature is non-local. So how much communication would be needed to reproduce that moment? I mean, if I could send some classical bits instantaneously from Alice to Bob, how many would I need to reproduce what we see in quantum mechanics? And uh, Tim Warden says that you know, for the simplest case, two qubit bell state, maximum entangled state, you can do this with five bits of communication. As a mathematical result, he's the first person to study it. It's a good result. Um, now, in quantum information theory, this question now becomes practically relevant. It's a question of communication complexity, like the communication complexity of communicating quantum systems. So it starts to be studied by physicists, mathematicians, and uh, the first people to publish a result of it were Brassard, Cleve, and Tapp. So uh, Tim's book, when it comes out, like mid-90s, early 90s, something like that, this is happening in 1999, several years afterwards. They show that you can reproduce the same thing that Tim already showed you need five bits to reproduce with eight bits of classical communication, blissfully unaware of Maudlin's result. Based on this paper, the subject becomes more popular, few people write about it, the number of bits goes down, culminating in a paper by uh, Dave Bacon and uh, Ben Toner, which show that you can do it with one bit of communication. That's obviously the best result you can have. Uh, but none of these papers ever cite Maudlin's result. Mm -hmm. I can think of many, many examples like this. What's going on? What's going on is that, in my view, the, the conventions about publishing and communication in philosophy versus physics are very, very different. Physicists don't often think to read, to read a book, whereas a book is a very, very common publication unit in philosophy. Like, books are important, right? Uh, and so if something's in a book and not in a physics journal, in a four page paper, it's often missed. So actually physicists and philosophers are quite often working on the same thing. And they quite often arrive at the same conclusion, but more, more times than not, I would argue that they arrive at the same conclusion independently because the communication between the two groups is not anywhere near as good as it ought to be. Um, <clears throat> that's just an argument that it ought to be better. So to conclude, is philosophy useful for quantum physics and or vice versa? So it is very tempting to draw strong philosophical conclusions from quantum theory. Lots of people have done it. I would argue that those are always going to be fraught with difficulty because we don't agree what the theory says about the nature of reality. And it's also the case that philosophers have in fact contributed to the development of quantum physics, but there are reasons for that. It may be because they're also really physicists. It may be because their uh, papers are highly cited by physicists, but actually very little read. 
And it might be because uh, you know they contributed, their results were ignored and then independently rediscovered. Um, so those might be the most common reasons, I, I don't know for sure. Uh, so for Bell, the case of Bell's theorem in particular, historians are now working on it. There have been several books published. Uh, they do contradict each other on what's the most important thing, but I think that debate is ongoing. The real story is, of course, complicated, and uh, I think you know the consensus will be reached on the role of philosophy there. Ultimately, personally, I find both physics and philosophy interesting. I'm not particularly interested, generally, in, in trying to rigidly classify what's physics or philosophy. I think that's uh, impossible to do. I don't want to decide who counts as a physicist or a philosopher. I don't really want to determine whether one subject is useful to the other. I think questions in both subjects are interesting. So as long as we're asking interesting questions, just get on with doing the work in whatever uh, department will have us. <laughs> Thank you. Question? Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, so, I mean, I, I share your skepticism about this object of science, uh, but I think I want to dispute the idea that quantum mechanics is principally to blame for this. Okay. Because the notion of objective chance significantly predates quantum mechanics. You know, yeah. And has this nice way that he goes back and like traces how it was there, right, and the origins of the theory of probability and like the class and stuff. Um, so, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm inclined to say the relationship is kind of the other way around, that there was already this notion of objective chance kind of lurking around and it was hard to connect physics. And then when quantum mechanics came along, it was kind of taken up as a straightforward way to interpret what was going on without having to think too hard about what's happening in measurement. measurement. So, I, I think the relationship is kind of going the opposite way. Yeah, I mean, that, that's probably right. I mean, I just wanted to say something negative about objective chance, really, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, but yeah, I, I mean, so what you're saying is right. It's certainly true that, however, in papers, people have relied on this necessity for quantum mechanics as an argument for this. So that, that's definitely true. Um, so thanks, Matt. Um, I, I, I think I have three things I want to say. So the first one is that um, uh, you use this very tempting trick that physicists often use in classifying any bad argument whether well, done by Wigner or whoever, is it <laughs> philosophy? Any good argument, irrespective of the person's disciplinary background and affiliation and so on, and then physics. Um, right, and so it, you know, it's, it's uh, Arthur Fine is influential, not for the right kinds of reasons, but because these physicists are doing philosophy because they're getting bad arguments. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I, I'm, say, I'm saying that uh, I don't really care whether they're doing physics or philosophy. I do care that they're making a bad conclusion from, from his work, right? Whether that's physics or philosophy, I don't really matter. But surely it's being influential in physics, even if it's a bunch it's of- It's being influential in, in physics, but but remember, I, what, what, the way I defined um, at the beginning, I said I was interested in the canon, right? So what work becomes part of canon? I would hope that a bad argument or an incorrect argument doesn't in the long term become part of Part of the canon of physics or philosophy, I hope. But so. so the second thing I wanted to say is that I mean the Petowski case is really grist from a mill, though, right? I mean, yeah. what I was arguing was that uh, philosophy provides home for physicists who are not finding yeah. you know people who are contributing to problems of physics, whether those are physicists or philosophers, not interesting to me. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, Petowski was a Boob student, Boob was a Bohm student. Yeah. In fact, Boob's dissertation was on issues in quantum logic, not in the fine sense, but in the yeah. actual by Neumann to Yaw her own. Yeah, yeah. Sense. So, so um, here's what I want to say about that. Okay, so, so in order to accept that, I, I mean, so I, I accept what you're saying. But in order to accept that that's really necessary, I also have to accept that uh, it is not just some fluke of history that it was banned to study quantum foundations in physics departments effectively. So your argument is, okay, uh, you gave this argument that uh, the culture in physics and philosophy is very different. In physics, you have to publish papers fast and you know, get lots of grant money and all this kind of stuff. Whereas in philosophy, there's time for slow thinking. And that is definitely true. Now, was it true during all of this history? That I'm not sure about, right? So um, I'm talking about periods of history lasting from yeah, about the 1960s to uh, last thing, uh, Pisiowski's 1989. 
the, the publication culture that we're talking about now wasn't, certainly wasn't around at the beginning of that era. So there were people, and there still are people in physics departments who do long, slow thinking, right? There are people who publish papers that are hundreds of pages long, like Lucy and Hardy, uh, Marcus Muller, you know, right? Uh, me, uh, you know, there are people in physics departments who do this, right? Uh, and so it's not completely banned. Um, and I would imagine that it was easier earlier. It's also the case that, as you said, there are far more physicists than philosophers. So there only needs to be a tiny, tiny percentage of people in this doing this in physics for it to be comparable to what's going on in philosophy. So, um, you know, had it not been the case that, uh, you know, for, and David Kaiser is actually quite good on the, on the history of why uh, these foundational things like dropped out of view. Um, I don't want to go into that, but had it not been the case, it needn't have been the case that that happened. And had that not happened, I don't know that it necessarily, that Pitalski might have been sitting in the physics department. And maybe that's a natural place for him. As I say, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't really think these distinctions are all that important at the end of the day. You know, good work gets done where it gets done. But, um, you know, the point of that is to just say, well, you know, if we're going to start saying what's physics and philosophy, it certainly looks like this book, uh, you know, it has a more natural home in, in, in the physics or mathematics uh, than it does in philosophy in general. So. And the third thing is that there's a, I think, a really interesting connection between Bigner's stuff on quantum mechanics. I mean, because Bigner was talking about the stuff with von Neumann and also with Ziller yeah. throughout his whole career. Um, but they were also talking about uh, epistemic interpretations of probabilities and classical statistical mechanics. And mm -hmm. so James, for instance, yeah. cites Bigner as um, uh, sort of the inspiration for, for his work. And I think that there's like, this kind of I like idea of somehow mind dependent probabilities that are coming up, not just in quantum mechanics in this school of thought. Yeah. Um, which you know, and so it's not just it's like not as simple. I think as big mirror, you know, having this. Uh, yeah, I mean, I let's just say if if ever you if you're trying to like present this as an argument for. The interactional against the interaction, however you present it, is going to be oversimplified, right? Mm -hmm. In reality, there are various strands that connect people. I'm not offering this as a criticism yeah. of you. I, just, I think it's an interesting bit of history. It is an interesting bit of history. And also, both Vigna and James were physicists, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks uh, for your talk. I would like to uh, add that basically, I don't know that physics, physician, physicists, I'm sorry, are the only ones who do not read what they call it. This is infinitely more widespread. Uh, and uh, so I don't think that uh, um, the opposition between the two uh, publishing patterns is yeah. critical. But I think that perhaps. And in fact, we just had an example of this uh, in the exchange. Oral communication, oral circulation yeah. of idea. You know, we have all the time we talk, so yeah. we might want to refer to an idea we have, vaguely referring to where we see the author uh, has published it, uh, but we got the idea through as a channel. Yeah. So this is what makes history very difficult. That's so, absolutely important, yeah. And, and, and I go, like the conferences I go to, a lot of them are as many philosophers as physicists. So that's how I know about a lot of this stuff, right? Through those interactions. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, things, and so I think that that is important. I think that there probably aren't enough, that there are, the trouble in the foundations of quantum mechanics recently, I would say, is that, you know, since it was a hard thing to do, a hard thing to be allowed to do in physics departments, you had to, you had to be at a certain amount of tenacity and a certain amount of just interest in, in foundational philosophical problems anyway, to even start doing it. Um, these days, there's a bit more funding in it, and uh, people are going into it as sort of more of just a technical field sometimes, right? And they don't know about the connections to philosophy. And so I would say that uh, because of that, things are getting worse <laughs> in terms of this uh, likelihood of just uh, 
you know, passing each other in the night rather than uh, rather than having a proper influence on each other. Um, so yeah. And it made, my main comment was rather on your last slide. Yeah. Um, I agree completely that you do want to classify and the subject and classify people and so on. However, I wonder whether a term that has been used, which is the term of culture, mm -hmm. it might be interesting to try to um, understand that there are differences even if we do want to rigidify these differences. And by this, I mean, um, there might be disciplinary values uh, that might be um, upheld by some milieus and that are different from other. So let me return back to rigor. Okay? Yeah. Physicists associating rigor to mathematicians, this is a kind of disciplinary value. And as I yeah. told you when we were talking, not all mathematicians would uh, accept this value. So cultures yeah. are absolutely there are different cultures among mathematicians, but there might be ways of defining cultures and ways of engaging with problems, uh, ways of uh, adopting some epistemological values that could be useful to try to identify the cultures that are at play in the making of something. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And yeah, and, and you're certainly right to point out that it's not like there's a ubiquitous physics culture or a ubiquitous philosophy culture that you know there are subcultures and that's how you know minority fields can can survive and that is yeah so very important to understand that uh, and you're right that it deserves further study maybe last question uh, yeah uh, Matt, um, I want to invite you to say a little bit more about Michael Redhead because oh, okay. in my view um, his monograph I think was 1987 yeah or so uh, yeah, the first real substantive treatment on the philosophical side of the. So you know, well, I was going to, um, I was going to do that story, but I realised it would take too long. Um, so yeah, so that monograph. By the way, um, I spoke to Lucien Hardy about this, and, and he said that that monograph was very influential on him. Why? Because it was the only book, yeah. right? So it did have a tremendous influence because. Um, his book, which was called cool, Apostle Common Law and Non Locality or Realism, something like that. Now, interestingly, in that book and in earlier papers, um, Redhead and collaborators had come up with a version of Bell's theorem without inequalities. Okay, it uses the Cauchy Speck construction on two sides of a maximally entangled state. Okay, so that was the first time that came up in the 1980s. Later on, so there's another example of physicists not knowing anything about what went on in the philosophy literature, that we have the GHZ argument, which is the same thing, except with a slightly simpler construction. It involves one two parties, but simpler construction. And uh, that never cites uh, Reddit. Later, even later on, we have Cochin and Conway's free will theorem. Cochin and Conway use exactly the same construction as Reddit. They don't cite him up. Right. So those latter things were viewed as very important in the physics community, or at least the communities are interested in this stuff. And the result was basically there in the philosophical literature. Um, even you know, some well-known physicists had read the book, right? um, but somehow it, it didn't get uh, traction. So it's a very similar, I think it's a rather sad story because it deserves more credit. Um, a bit like the Tim Morden story uh, where, you know, Philosopher, philosoph philosophers made a contribution. Perhaps if it had been recognized earlier in the physics community, progress would have been faster. Um, so I think like these kind of uh, failures of communication are uh, interesting. We should try to uh, make sure they don't happen. So. Matt, you have some Ah, there's a comment in the chat yeah. by uh, Menas Kapatos. It's ah. yes, an excellent work and presentation, Matt. It's particularly important the point you made that both philosophy and physics are in some sense needed. Okay. And now, okay. maybe a last question, short question. Um, so, the, uh, both Jim Stark, I, I love the talk, by the way. Uh, uh, you're probably right uh, in the conclusion. But both your talk and Jim Stark made two claims about philosophy as a discipline that I actually think, and it's related to physics, I think is worth 
putting some square quotes around. Number one, um, in the period that we're discussing, most philosophers were told that journal articles were the way to go. Mm -hmm. Philosophy of physics is actually an interesting uh, complication to that story. The second thing, which I think is also quite interesting, is in my generation, we were told making mistakes in philosophy is more sinful than being, than being original. Right. So what that meant was that actually philosophy physics looked weird to the rest of us. And I was in a department, uh, Stein Malibut, where the material that you just quoted was taught as bad philosophy. Hmm. Right. Yeah. And you could hear Stein even say, you know, this fucking stuff is, is just bad. Right. And Malibut by instantiation. Um, so I think there's also a kind of sense here that philosophy isn't as self-correcting as it might be thought, because particularly in that period, the material that you're describing as weird philosophy wasn't really thought of as really fantastic. Now, I think something interesting happened when David Albert became one of, and, and then David Wallace became one of the standard bearers in philosophy and physics yeah. outside the West Coast, um, where uh, what was expected of that subfield really shifted, I think, quite dramatically in a discipline. Yeah. I mean, one thing I'd say about that is like, you know, despite my criticism, I I you know I, I generally no, that was clear. I generally like the uh, naturalistic view of mathematics. Yeah. Okay. I know that may be controversial. Um so you know they they are putting up with that. Um the other thing I'd say is that. I think there's, there should be room in philosophy for uh, crazy ideas that don't make sense. Yes. Uh, for example, if I, you know, I've, I've seen many cases where, you know, sometimes you germinate an idea and it's going to take a few years for it to really make sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. If people leap on with criticism at, right at the beginning, it sometimes stifles the idea. Um, so, you know, one of the things I imagine is what if we had philosophers of science doing that kind of criticism uh, really in the early days of quantum mechanics. And uh, right. exists. You know, between 1900 and 1925, the theory made no coherent sense, yeah. okay? There's a bunch of ad hoc rules yeah. which contradict each other. Yeah. And so a philosopher could easily come in and say, well, this can't possibly be the theory, and they'd be right. But that needed to be developed yeah. into the core theory. So, uh, you know, there is, a, there is a danger of doing that. And I've seen things which are a little bit like that. Like there was a meeting in 2005 organized by Chris Fuchs. So he invited a bunch of philosophers there. And the idea was to try and, you know, develop the point of view. And what happened at that meeting was, it was like talk after talk saying, your view can't possibly be right because scientific realism is right and you don't solve the measurement problem. And after hearing that, about five times in a row, it got very depressing. So, you know, sometimes maybe adversarial collaborations could help here, right? So sometimes it would be helpful uh, if people try to help um, steel man the, 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 the argument before, before criticizing like that. Because, you know, again, hearing the same criticism, which is a valid criticism, but hearing it over and over again doesn't necessarily help to develop a theory. 